um, with their answers. And I think it is now time to move on to our, our last uh, talk of this session, which is from Roland Kolliker from Zurich. And he's going to talk about genomics assisted breeding in red clover. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Catherine. And uh, <clears throat> it's my great pleasure to uh, show you some of the results we achieved with uh, red clover here in the UCLEC project. And this is actually a huge joint effort of many people involved in various tasks, ranging from providing seed, establishing field trials, conducting specific analysis, uh, experiments, and analyzing the data. And I would only like to highlight a few of all these. First of all, Christoph Kriedig, who basically acted as a vice species leader and was of great support to me in organizing all the tasks involved in establishing the field trials, uh, getting the seed set out to people and so on. And then a big thank you also goes to the um, people involved in establishing and conducting the field trials. Libor from the LF in the Czech Republic, Helga from Graminor in Norway, Leif from Ibus in the UK, and Yasmina from uh, IK, IK, IKBKS in uh, Serbia. And then finally, I'm going to present today the data um, gathered and analyzed by a range of different people from Agroscope, Christoph Kriedig and Michel Ney, from ETH, the disease resistance data, Lea. Then life contributed a lot to the, the GBS and the genomic prediction data I'm going to, uh, to show. I would like to thank Tim and Tom from Ilvo for their um, support and the results I'm going to show, and also Julia and Marie from INRAE. Arshild and Stefano from Norway for the data on persistence and uh, winter survival. And finally, Anna from Nordgen in, in uh, Sweden for gathering all the uh, descriptive data of the accessions. So with that, I would like to start just very briefly introducing Red Clover because uh, we already had heard quite a, a few details from uh, from David before, just want to remind you that this is really an important uh, forage legume grown as a roughage for ruminants in pure stands or in mixture with forage grasses. And it's of particular importance to providing roughage, especially in areas where you can't um, grow any arable crops. And you would be surprised to see how many of these areas we actually have worldwide. And another um, big advantage of red clover, of course, is its ability to fix at atmospheric nitrogen and also to transfer this nitrogen to companion species, which then can le uh, lead to uh, transgressive, transgressive overyielding, for example, when grown in mixtures, and also makes it a very important component in crop rotations to improve soil fertility in between um, arable crops, especially valued in organic agriculture. Very grateful to David for giving such a detailed introduction in the breeding of uh, outbreeding species. So I don't need to say a lot about breeding strategy here that has already been very nicely covered. And also the breeding aims, David already mentioned for red clover, it's mostly yield and quality, persistence, disease resistance, and a range of other traits which are emerging or already um, yeah, quite pop, uh, quite prominent, as David always also mentioned. For example, the seed yield. Breeding strategies have been nicely covered. There's a range of different uh, strategies. Also, one has been quite nicely shown in detail by Bernadette just in the talk before. So I think we can safely skip over this here. It's just important to remember we're dealing with an open pollinated species. So the resulting cultivars always are populations. And this is one of the major challenges in red clover breeding. So we deal with population-based cultivars. We have very complex pedigrees with many parents, just illustrated on the right here. Um, 
and brief glimpse in a, in a breeding program. And this all makes the fixation of traits very difficult. And then also, as mentioned before, this is a, a pluriannual crop, so and, and some tree, uh, traits, such as, for example, persistence. Um, for these traits, the improvement is quite slow because it takes many seasons uh, of phenotyping to finally get advances. And, and also the changing requirements, such as emerging pathogen populations or emerging pathogen species due to changing uh, climatic conditions or a general change in environmental conditions pose a big challenge to red clover breeding. But on the other hand, we also have quite a few opportunities. As um, Bernadette already pointed out, it's the same in red clover. We have quite a large pool of genetic resources. And actually, we have the advantage that we have wild populations and ecotypes uh, grown simultaneously as the cultivated crops. So there's quite a, a big gene pool we can actually uh, draw, draw upon when doing red clover breeding. And we have quite efficient breeding schemes and a lot of knowledge in phenotyping. And as we heard before uh, already a few times with um, the advances in um, genome sequencing technologies, we have uh, a lot of opportunities coming up on that end as well. So there's an increasing availability of genomic resources. Uh, a lot of reference genomes are now being established. We have low sequence, low cost sequencing technologies, and also the appropriate uh, statistical concepts are constantly being developed. So this makes it really an ideal time to start thinking about implementing genomics, genomics assisted breeding in red clover as well. And uh, Bernadette already introduced a lot of the, the strategies that can be used for alfalfa. It's exactly the same in red clover, so I won't um, touch on this in too much detail again. So this brings me to the aim of the UCLEC project for red clover in particular. So it's the establishment of a diverse collection of red clover germplasm, and then, of course, create a lot of uh, genotypic and phenotypic information with the aim to develop concepts and models for genomics-assisted breeding, but also with the aim to elucidate the genetic control of specific traits to enable efficient breeding uh, methods. So the Euclid red clover germplasm finally consisted of uh, 397 accessions. They were derived from 25 different countries. We have a few key players in this um, um, in this list. So uh, Switzerland and Sweden contributed the most accessions, around 100. Then we have uh, Serbia, Norway, and the UK, which contributed around 25. The Czech Republic contributed 50, and the rest was e more or less evenly distributed among the countries uh, listed here or colored here in, in blue on this map. And also the germplasm could be divided into different categories. We had breeding materials, uh, cultivars, land races, and ecotypes. And then as life already nicely introduced, there was the generation of genomic data. So we already heard that. We, use 200 plants per accession to uh, genotype by sequence the, um, these, well, the, the SNPs present in these populations. And finally, after applying all the filter, filtering methods, we came up with a set of around 20,000 reliable SNPs, which were evenly distributed among the seven chromosomes of uh, red clover, which you see on the right on this slide, and also some uh, not assigned to particular chromosomes, but still mapped against the red clover uh, reference genome, and therefore uh, also a valuable resource for um, further analysis. Um, as Bernadette already showed, we did basically a similar approach. We used uh, principal component analysis based on these 20,000 uh, single nucleotide polymorphisms, 
to get an idea about the genetic diversity present um, in our germplasm collection. And what you see here is a, a biplot of the first two principal components, and each dot represents um, one of the 397 accessions. And you can quite nicely see we have some sort of uh, structuring according to uh, the different breeding materials. So the, the land races seem to be uh, quite a prominent group and also the ecotypes or the outliers on the, on the top right of this, um, of this graph indicated here and here. But if you then look at from where these, um, com uh, these accessions were actually derived, you quite nicely see that these are actually more effects of the location we see here than the effect of actually the breeding materials. So most of the land races we have in this um, set were derived from Switzerland and they all nicely um, cluster in one corner of this principal component analysis and also the accessions from uh, Northern Europe form quite a distinct cluster. And also we have some outliers or a distinct group of uh, ecotypes coming from Southern Europe. So this is important to keep in mind when we have a, a further look at the data later on. So just to sum this up very briefly, so we have a nice set of accessions genotyped with a large number of SNPs, and we saw some clear genetic structure among these accessions, mainly based on the regions where they were collected from. And of course, this presents a very valuable resource for further analysis. And then, um, in addition to the genotyping, of course, we set out to do quite a large scale phenotypic characterization of these accessions. So we established field trials at five different locations in Switzerland, in the Czech Republic, in Wales, in Serbia, and in Norway. And uh, in these locations, the phenotyping was conducted uh, on the entire set of the 395 accessions in Switzerland and in the Czech Republic. And then we had 200 accessions which were phenotyped in three locations. And in addition, 20 accessions which were phenotyped um, in all five accessions. And all this was uh, arranged in a, in a PREP design previously introduced by Isabel last uh, yesterday. And the phenotyping was also, as it was shown for alfalfa, conducted during two growing seasons, two, um, after the establishment, the following two seasons. We looked at um, establishment, stand density, persistence, time of flowering, then of course forage yield and quality. Disease occurrence was um, scored in the field and we um, did some dynamics of uh, regrowth analysis, which I will not go into detail here in this presentation. And as for the uh, genetic data I showed you before, we also used in a first step the phenotypic traits we collected in, um, in all these field trials to get an idea up about the distribution of the phenotypic diversity. You see here again, a principal component analysis, this time um, based on blues calculated from the field trial data from all the five sites. And you can see there's not that a distinct clustering as we have seen it before, but you can identify quite a few groups again, occur according to the origin of the accessions. And probably the most remarkable grouping is the one of the accessions from the Northern European countries, but you also see some structure from uh, Eastern Europe and Switzerland and, and Central European countries. And if you compare this to the genetic data on the right, you can see 
a little bit of congruence, maybe not completely, but you can clearly see that the genetic structure detected with the SNPs is also to some extent reflected in the phenotypic diversity observed um, based on traits evaluated in the field. If you look a little bit closer at the, the field data, and I have to, to say here that all the um, experimental results I'm showing, these are uh, rather prel preliminary data and the analysis is still ongoing. Some is a bit more advanced, others a bit less. So just treat that as a first glimpse into what might be coming in the future as well. But here as a first um, look into the phenotypic data from all the field trials, we looked at the composition of the variants obtained in the different experiments uh, that you have on the on the x-axis and the different colors are the different variants components. So you have in green the genotype effect, then in, uh, in pink it's the residual variants, green and blue are the block effects of the experiment, and then in the combined analysis you also have the genotype by location interaction. And on the x-axis are the, the five different sites. And you can see for all the three traits I selected to show here for juvenile plant density, total dry matter per uh, yield in year one, and the vigor ratings in year one, we have quite a strong effect of the genotype. And therefore, this is certainly a very valuable basis for any further analysis. What was also quite clear from this analysis is that you have quite um, a large effect of genotype by location interaction. If you look at the combined analysis um, across all the five sites. And this I would like to go into a bit more detail in the next few slides. First, I would like to show you an analysis where we only looked at the 20 accessions which were grown at all the five locations. And uh, each line here is one accession and you have the scorings or the phenotypic data for the five different sites. And on the x-axis, on the left is Graminor in Norway. Um, in the middle is Switzerland, WBF and uh, IKBKS, Serbia is on the far right. And if we, for example, look at the Nordic accessions, the accessions from Northern Europe, you can quite nicely see this is data for uh, total dry matter in the first year. You can quite nicely see that these accessions do fairly well in, uh, in, uh, in Norway, in the Graminor site, but they perform quite poorly on in all the other um, in all the other locations, which can of course be explained by the um, adaptation to northern climates. Also, if you look at other accessions here, I just randomly picked one example for, um, for Switzerland. You see that it performed uh, very poorly on the Nordic conditions, better, uh, for example, in the UK and best in, uh, in Switzerland itself. And this is actually something we observed. If we look now at all the 395 accessions from uh, which were evaluated in the, in the five locations, that most accessions seem to perform best at home. And I just indicated again the Northern European um, accessions here indicated with the arrows and in uh, li light yellow and also a similar situation for the Swiss accessions. And this clearly indicates the importance, of course, of breeding um, red clover on the conditions where it's actually intended to be used later on. And this is something which also has to be accounted for in uh, any uh, prediction models for genomic selection. 
So we observed a significant effect of accession at all the locations. We had significant accession by location interactions. And I just said that about the breeding for specific locations. And this, of course, is a valuable data set for further analysis, as uh, Bernadette also showed for um, genomic selection and genomic prediction. And here we're not quite as far as um, in alfalfa, so I can only show you very pre preliminary results. But um, it's the same situation as in alfalfa. Prior to UCLEC, there were not many studies on GWAS or genomic selection in red clover, but this would um, allow for the development of a platform for predictive breeding in red clover. And Life Scott just made a first attempt in um, look at the ability to uh, predict based on these data I just showed you um, certain traits in this germplasm and we found some quite substantial prediction accuracy for some traits. And you see this here on this graph. Um, this is the prediction accuracy for uh, crude protein, CP, on the left in each panel and dry matter yield in year one and year two. And in the left panel, you have the DLF site, which was uh, where all the 395 accessions were phenotyped. And on the right, the same for the Switzerland site at Agroscope. And you can see that um, we have quite distinct differences in predictive ability, uh, depending also on the location where the field trials were established. But this needs to be. Um, analyzed in, in more details, but of course we have now first predictions um, and these can basically be used for, for uh, further development of prediction models. And as um, Bernadette quite nicely showed that one way of improving these models is uh, incorporating QTLs um, you find using GVAS. And that brings me to the second main topic of this talk, and this is actually the genetic control of specific traits. So we conducted a, a range of uh, experiments on the control, controlled conditions in order to uh, elucidate the or to de detect um, QTLs for some key traits, which can be used to identify candidate genes and to better understand um, the control of these traits, but also which can then later be used to improve the prediction models. And I will focus um, for the remaining time on three main traits, disease resistance, persistence, and seedling emergence. And I'll start with one of the most important um, diseases in red clover. This is uh, Southern Anthrocnose caused by Coletotrichium trifoliae. And we have, have found it to be increasingly problematic due to rising temperatures. It, it can cause uh, very severe yield losses, especially in uh, warmer climates. At the moment, it's not such a problem in Nordic countries, but in Switzerland, for example, in the last years, it has become a major threat to uh, red clover production. So for this, we used all the accessions we had available and um, performed artificial inoculation using single spore isolates or one single spore isolate of Colectotrichium trifoliae. And we an analyzed the survival rate um, and used this data for association analysis. And what you see here is an overview of the susceptibility of these accessions. So each dot again is a um, one genotype, uh, no, one accession, sorry. And you have it uh, split it up according to the countries of origin. And what I've plotted on the y-axis is the survival rate, meaning the higher the survival rate, the better the resistance. And you can quite nicely see that most of the accessions we tested in the greenhouse were highly susceptible to Southern Anthrocnose. There is a few accessions, mainly from, uh, from Switzerland and the US, which showed a quite high uh, degree of resistance. 
but um, a lot of the accessions, and put, I just highlighted two uh, groups here, the breeding material of, of Sweden and the land races of Switzerland showed very poor um, resistance to southern endocrinose. If we use this data and, and uh, for for Chivas using the panel of SNPs I just described before, we can find um, a number of significant um, QTL and uh, some of them explained quite a large proportion of the variance. For example, this one on chromosome one, which explained up to 16%. Or the other one on uh, linkage group seven, around nine percent. So these are certainly interesting candidates for uh, further um, investigations and also for the development of marker-assisted breeding strategies. Another important um, disease in red clover is uh, clover rot caused by sclerotinia trifoliorum, and this is work conducted um, in ILVO. Uh, basically a similar approach, greenhouse experiment with uh, artificial inoculation using single spore isolates or one single spore isolate of uh, sclerotinia and uh, also the survival, oh, this is actually it's not that the survival rate that was, well, the survival rate was determined and then uh, a disease severity index was calculated. And the higher this index is, the more susceptible the plants were in the greenhouse. So it's the other way around to what I just showed you. And you see here again, it's quite um, substantial susceptibility we have in these accessions, but this time the Nordic accessions seem to be uh, better. So I indicated here Norway, which had a, in, on average a distinctly lower um, adjusted disease severity index than for example, the accessions uh, from Switzerland. So this indicates a clear need for breeding in certain countries as well. And again, uh, GVAS analysis identified a few interesting candidates which we will now use for further characterization. For example, this one here on chromosome three and also some on interesting high, um, explaining a very high amount of variability on the, on the scaffolds. Another very important trait particularly in northern countries is freezing tolerance, which is known to be um, associated with general uh, persistence, as is also disease resistance, of course. And this is um, work conducted uh, in Norway. And um, here the Freezing tolerance was assessed in the in the greenhouse or in the on the controlled conditions by uh, using 393 accessions subject, subjected to different freezing temperatures in the growth chamber, and then the LT50 was determined as the temperature where 50% of the plants uh, perish. And this was then again used to identify. Um, candidate genes. And also here we have a set of eight significant SNPs, which detected around, or which explained around 45% of the phenotypic variation. And this certainly is a very interesting resource for further characterization of this, this trait and for developing breeding strategies. And also here we looked at the persistence, particularly the persistence in the field. And um, as for the general field data, I first show you here the persistence only for the 20 accessions which were grown um, at, uh, at all the five locations. And this is data from, uh, from four locations. And you see here that um, 
need to find the thing to advance the slide again. So what you, what you see here is each um, symbol again is the is one accession, and um, the arrows indicate the the different explanatory variables that were used, and this were different um, scorings of stand density, for example, in Norway on the. Uh, and these seem to separate the accessions towards the, the left or the upper left. And then you have the on the right, the stand density in the Czech Republic and Switzerland and Serbia, which seems to um, distinguish in the other direction. And you can quite nicely see that the, there were some accessions clearly performing better in uh, Norway they showed a better persistence in the Norwegian uh, location, and these were mainly the Nordic varieties and one Belgium and one Swiss variety. And these varieties also showed uh, better sclerotinia resistance and better freezing tolerance. So these are traits also um, associated to uh, a better persistence. And on the other hand, you have the uh, other accessions performing better under uh, Czech, Swiss and Serbian conditions. If we look at this in a bit more detail and now just look at the performance in the Nordic location at Arneberg at uh, Graminor. Again, the same uh, setup of the slide. So the accessions this time, it's all the 393 accessions are indicated by the symbols. The triangles indicate the Nordic um, accessions and the arrows again indicate the different explanatory variables. This time it's uh, mainly stand density just in the, the Nor Norwegian location and you can quite nicely see this time it's just inversed so the Nordic um, accessions they are clearly separated by uh, principal components um, associated to, um, to winter survival, so um, better, um, well, stand density in, um, in Norway and or after winter. Here you have the uh, arrows explained in a little bit more detail, so it's mainly uh, stand density and yield in the years 2019 to 21, but also sclerotinia resistance and freezing tolerance in the um, on the controlled condition seem to separate the Nordic accessions quite well from the remaining other accessions. On the other hand, the other accessions they were characterized by a better growth and a better uh, well, here indicated by a higher stand height in in the first year, in autumn 2018, before they had to undergo the severe um, winter conditions of Norway. So this certainly also is a quite nice data set to uh, be used later on, also for the improvement of genomic prediction models. And with this, I would like to come to the last um, trait, I would briefly like to show you some interesting results and this is our experiments um, conducted in France at INRE and this is seedling emergence, an important trait uh, concerning the establishment, rapid establishment of uh, red clover swords. And here I would like to show you just briefly the results of three inter, uh, important traits. So one would be the time to mean germination on the left. So the time in hours for 50% of the seeds to germinate. Then we have the root length, which was reached under dark conditions during germination and uh, emergence and also the speed of emergence, which is characterized as the time of uh, for 50% of the seed to show emergence of the cotyledons above the soil surface. And you can see that depending on the origin of the accessions, we see quite a large variability in this um, germplasm. 
And I just highlighted here one interesting fact is that some um, accessions can actually have um, a higher time to mean germination, but still be faster in, uh, in emergence. And then on other interesting feature we observed, uh, you see on these slides here. So here you, we have plotted the root length on the y-axis against the speed of emergence or uh, seedling emergence on the x-axis. And you see, of course, um, a high correlation. But more interestingly, you see a clear grouping of the land races, or in this case, the Swiss land races, which seem to be faster uh, in emergence than most of the other um, accessions. And also, if you use this data for um, for GWAS, then we find quite interesting candidates on two chromosomes, which need to be uh, investigated in more detail in the future. So I hope I could show you that we have quite a nice set of uh, well-characterized red clover accessions, and we generated a very nice data set of phenotypic and genotypic data, which will provide the basis for genomics-assisted breeding strategies, as were quite nicely outlined by uh, Bernadette just in the talk before. And uh, we are convinced that this is a very important step towards improved red clover breeding. And this, with this, I would like to finish, and I thank you for your attention, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much, Roland, for the excellent talk. Uh, we have had a number of questions that have come through. Some of them, I think, are quite specific to um, particular slides in your talk. So the, the first question, you, you referred to year one. Um, was that the year of sowing or the year after? I think that maybe that was. I know. Uh, yeah, the yield data I showed was after. This is after the after the sowing. So it's the sowing year, and then we have which we considered as year zero, and then we have year one, which would be the first after the first winter after sowing. Okay, thank you. Yeah. And the next question is referring to the use of GBS on pooled population samples. Um, what is the relationship between the precision of the allele frequency estimates and the trait prediction accuracies? What is the relationship between the precision of the... I'm, I'm not sure. I don't know. Maybe life, maybe you can help me on that, but I'm not sure what... Um. Yeah, well, um, yeah, I'm not 100% sure either. But if um, if if it refers, to, I mean, we basically haven't done that experiment because we would have to, as far as I understand it, the question, it would be, we would have to genotype individual plants and then uh, uh, determine the allele frequency on the basis of that. And of course, that is more accurate uh, than pooling the, the individual genotypes from population. But as, as so we, we haven't done that uh, specific comparison because it's, uh, it would be a quite an expensive genotyping um, exercise. Um, so uh, yeah, no, we, we 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 that experiment has not been done, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, yeah, I, that's the best I can do. Uh, yeah, yeah, thanks for that. And and I'm not sure it would actually uh, improve a lot because I mean the phenotyping is done on the populations as well. Yes. So indeed. there's not really then you would have to do phenotyping on indi individual plants as well, if I understand that correctly. Well, you would have to get the allele frequency data based on genotyping uh, 200 red clover plants individually. Mm -hmm. And if you had to do that for 641 accessions, it would be an astronomical uh, price. Uh, 
Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so that's a difficult experiment to. <laughs> okay, thank you. And uh, a specific question on the seedling emergence uh, screen. Was any um, comparison made to performance of emergence in the field? Do yeah, that's actually a very interesting point. Uh, no, I don't think we have looked at that. We have, I mean, I showed you the very beginning, we have the, the juvenile um, establishment in the field. So that's just one, one, uh, a one year observation, but it would be very interesting to compare this with the, the data from, from the controlled experiments, but we haven't done that. And I realize that life has asked you a question as well which was concerning the PCA analysis of the phenotypic data. Was that, I think that was when, when you were looking at the structure of the population. Exactly. Was that based on all the recorded traits or just a subset of the traits? Yeah, to my shame, I must say, I can't answer this uh, question 100%. I know that a lot of traits were used, but probably not all of them. But most of the traits were used. Okay, thank you. <laughs> I think that completes all, all the questions that are specific to, to Roland. So thank you very much for that. Well, sure, thanks. Question. Now, we, we do have a very short amount of time available. Um, if anybody has any general questions that they would like to ask any of the speakers. Um, or if there are um, from either yesterday or today. Um, so I don't know. If if there are any questions. I, I would like to actually ask a question myself, which is a, a general one, which I think is something that Bernadette um, touched on, which is the, the cost of, of um, genomic selection. Um, there are many research projects which have used genomic selection and have demonstrated how, how successful it can be in producing excellent predictions. Um, and these have been funded by you know, research grants, but how much is this actually being uh, translated into commercial breeding programs? I don't know if, if, if anybody is um, prepared to comment on, on that side of things. Uh, is there anybody from a commercial breeding program who would like to comment, perhaps? Well, before someone uh, uh, replies your, your question, uh, I would like to stress that we have uh, shown for most species that, in fact, we, we need many markers to uh, find QTLs, uh, especially on uh, outbreeding species because the end is so short. But uh, for genomic selection, we don't need that many um, markers. So, um, so in fact, it's the first uh, way to de decrease the cost is to get uh, less markers. So it doesn't mean less uh, uh, more missing data. So we, I think we need uh, accurate markers. So with a uh, uh, minimum number of uh, missing data, but we could have much less uh, loci or SMPs. So this is the first uh, way to decrease the cost. Uh, and of course, maybe the, the, the technical um, uh, way to review the markers is not in the future GBS. If I, except if we uh, find a way to uh, um, uh, get less markers than the current uh, events we have uh, used. But we, we, could, we could move to another technique too. So this is a, a quite a technical aspect. I'm not sure if the participants are able to 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 speak. In fact, to open their their uh, microphone. It is it is possible if a, if somebody would like to speak, they. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, uh, another aspect is uh, we are speaking uh, about uh, legumes. Uh, today and, and yesterday, and uh, these species are not uh, the species uh, with a, a huge uh, <laughs> um, 
huge uh, breeding program. So the, the cost is, of course, uh, a key problem, even with phenotypic uh, uh, selection. So it's, uh, in most cases, a problem to, to move towards uh, molecular breeding. But uh, uh, anyway, uh, I think there are some opportunities to, to move uh, to molecular breeding, uh, opening a, a, most, a more efficient, cost-efficient uh, uh, breeding. But it's, uh, it has to be demonstrated. Thank you. Does anybody want to add to that at all? If not, I don't. I haven't seen any more questions um, arise. Um, I think. Um, I think if that if there are no further questions, I'd just like to. I think we should draw this to a draw this to a close, and um, thank all today's speakers and those speakers from yesterday, um, covering all five species and also the introductions to the methods that were used, and and uh, very importantly the uh, coordination of all the data that Isabel um, referred to yesterday, um, so that you actually can get such impressive results that this project has come up with. Um, so I'd like to just close by um, wishing you all well. And there will be recordings available of most of the talks. And we will discuss how those will be shared amongst those who have registered um, in due course. Um, so thank you very much indeed for, for today's um, workshop. <laughs>